One of the things I've realized is that there's so many chemicals in laundry detergent and the soaps out there. So I either make it myself, it's actually pretty easy, or I use my green fills. If you go to chantelrayway.com slash soap, I'll give you my free recipe for laundry soap. Or if you just feel like buying one that's really clean and not filled with tons of chemicals, you can get it there. chantelrayway.com slash soap. Hey guys, I'm on my way home from being on national TV talking about intermittent fasting and I'm answering the question, does intermittent fasting help you lose weight? Maybe you guys have tried intermittent fasting and lost some weight, but now you might just be stuck in a rut where you're not losing as much as you want. Well, I've interviewed over a thousand thin eaters and I've learned that intermittent fasting is just one of the tools they use, but there's so many more. There's nine other principles that they use to stay thin. To get out of your rut, click here to watch this free video. Hey guys, welcome to today's episode. And we have Dr. E, also known as Dr. Ernesto, on our podcast today. And he, I love his saying because he says, I make health ridiculously simple. So Dr. E, welcome. Tell listeners a little bit about yourself and tell them why you make health ridiculously simple. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so the thing, I mean, I'm a physician, a little bit uh, about myself. I'm a physician by training. I specialized in age management uh, medicine and then regenerative medicine. I've been doing the stem cell treatments for, for, for quite a while now, uh, mostly on, on age management, longevity, and some neurological conditions. But uh, talking about the website and why I like to say, you know, making uh, health simple is because as the last couple of years, what we've been seeing a lot is that people or companies or everyone's just making it sound complicated so that you have to buy their product, their diet, their fix, their thing uh, in order to be healthy. Otherwise, you just can't do it. And, and I'm completely against that. Really, health is very simple. I like to call it. It's, it's a common sense, uh, commonsensical. And that's what I aim to do. I think that educating people, educating uh, patients uh, in regards to our health, which a lot of us didn't get any education on that front as we were growing up. We don't, we didn't get it on, in school or anything like that. Um, that's, that's pretty much the most useful and valuable uh, tool or help that we as physicians can provide people. So that's what mm -hmm. I aim to do. Awesome. Well, I know that you are a fan of the keto diet. And so obviously intermittent fasting is a form of keto, right? So talk a little bit about, you know, what, why you see so much benefit in intermittent fasting and the combination of keto. Well, so, so let's, let's, let's start first with the keto side of it. Um, all of the things that I talk about and that I recommend are things that I've actually done for myself. So uh, several years ago, I also fell for that whole vegan thing. Uh, I, I like to call to you know refer to myself as a recovering vegan because I did it for a long time. Uh, I did it for about two years, and at first I started feeling really really good. Uh, now I realize, looking back, I realize that it was because I cut out most of the crap that I was eating normally that most of us do on a regular basis. And but that's a very high fat, high carb. Uh, diet, right? And I started experimenting or experiencing really all the effects of a high carb diet, which, uh, you know, many people don't really put two and two together. But the fact that you have a meal, and you immediately crash right afterwards, and you feel tired, and you want to take a nap. That's the consequence of a very high, high carb diet. And I was constantly hungry. I was uh, constantly angry. I had low energy. I wasn't sleeping well. And so I realized that something wasn't working. Something just was not functioning the way it should. I had this brain fog uh, constantly at, at my job. I was, I was at the time, I was a chief medical officer at a stem cell research uh, and treatment facility. And so I, I just wasn't functioning the way I wanted to. And, and that's when I started reading a little bit more about the whole thing. And I started uh, really diving deep into the, the evidence behind high fat diets. And, uh, and that's when I started doing keto. So for me, it was a complete game changer. When I started upping my, my, my fat intake, I realized that animal products were, were not bad at all. Uh, it is the processing of them. I realized as well, or I learned that a lot of vegetables are not as healthy as we think they are. Um, 
most of them fall within this umbrella of, of just because they're a vegetable, they must be good, right? Because that's what we've been hearing all of our life. It's like, well, just eat your veggies, eat your fruits. Uh, when in reality, some of them aren't as beneficial for us as-, as So to talk about them. that. So I want you to say which ones aren't. So like, which, which one of the vegetables would you say they're not as healthy as, as you might think? Well, so in my, in my case, and, and again, this is something, this is actually something very, very interesting. And I'll share a little bit more with you in, in, in just a sec, how it affects, I mean, different people are completely differently affected by these things. But for me, uh, when I started noticing that eating, eating, for instance, super high carb, like potatoes and uh, even bananas that obviously are not vegetables, they're fruits, but, but they have a very high carb uh, concentration that wasn't serving me very well. And of course they do have fiber, so you don't absorb all of it. And, and you talk about net carbs and, and, and all these things. But for me, they weren't very, very uh, beneficial. A lot of the nightshade vegetables as well. I, I had a lot of inflammation that I didn't realize. I had a lot of bloating that I didn't put two and two together at the time uh, when, I, when I was eating these things. And when I read the Plant Paradox by Dr. Gundry, and I don't know if you're familiar with that book, mm-hmm. and, and it, it talks about the lectins, and he talks about all these different anti-nutrients that, that plants have, then it makes total sense. Plants are alive. They want to, they just like every other living organism, they want to uh, protect their species. So they have these antitoxins that they will try and utilize to protect themselves. So all of those things, I, I, I quickly realized that weren't, weren't serving me. And that's when I started not just going the keto route that a lot of people do, that it is they start getting rid of all vegetables and they just start eating a lot of, of, of meat and processed fats and processed oils and, and, and calling that keto, right? Um, so I started looking also at quality of foods and, and what I was actually consuming. And, uh, and, and that's re- that really was the turning point for me. I, I even went as far as kind of like bulletproof and I started adding fat to my, to my coffee. And it, it took me a while, but once I actually got to experience what ketosis was and what ketosis actually felt like, I was totally hooked. And since then, I've, I've, I've been on, on, on one form or, or, or another of a keto diet. So talk a little bit more about nightshade vegetables. So for people who don't know what nightshade vegetables are, what are some of the common nightshade vegetables? And what were some of the, how was the inflammation? How did you see that inflammation in your body? Well, so that's, that's part of the tricky part of it is that all of these inflammatory symptoms, they're not immediate a lot of the times, unless you have like an autoimmune disorder or things like that. It's not something that you eat and you immediately feel bad, right? But they keep adding up. So for me, it was mostly peppers. So especially the green peppers that, 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 were, that were affecting me. Um, it is uh, aubergine and uh, what do you call eggplant. So that one is also, is also considered. A lot of people get affected by tomatoes. I didn't. So, so all those different uh, vegetables that actually grow in the, in the shade, um, they do s- seem to have these different uh, inflammatory uh, components. And, and again, what's really interesting is that not everyone uh, responds the same. And as a Western trained physician, I was inclined at first to say like, no, 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 no. It, if, how come these people aren't being affected? So you, it, it must be something else. And, and the more I learn, the more I see different people, I realize that no, everyone is different. And, and some of us grew up, we have different microbiomes, we have different uh, genes, we have different everything. That's why some of us are affected more than others. So the example that I wanted to get to is my, I'm, I'm originally from Mexico. I grew up in Mexico City, uh, lived in Cancun. We've lived in the US for, for a while as well, my wife, she's from Spain. She grew up in Spain and she lived in Spain in the UK. Her microbiome is completely different to mine. We tried the exact same diet. There are things that affect her that don't affect me and vice versa. And it's not that we're making things up because when you, when you talk to a lot of people, they're like, no, this is the one diet that you must follow. It's like, no, it's, it's not true. This is the one diet that works for me. And this is the one diet that works for her. And, and, and they might have certain commonalities. They have, they might have certain common grounds. Like both of us, we, we try to keep it very low carb, but, but for her, she cannot do carnivore like I'm currently doing. She does need a little bit more carbs um, than I do. So it's, it's just, it's just understanding and listening to your body and, and recognizing that, you need to actually pay attention more to what you're feeling 
to what you're experiencing than what you're reading and what you're actually seeing on social media and elsewhere. Yeah, I love that because, you know, some people will, nightshade vegetables, you know, the big ones are white potatoes, tomatoes, eggplants, bell peppers, cayenne pepper, paprika. Those are kind of like the most popular ones. But there's people who say that, you know, I don't feel great when I eat a white potato, but I feel fine if I eat a purple potato or a yellow potato, sweet potatoes or yams or cauliflower um, because, you know, those aren't nightshades. So sometimes people think, oh, well, potato, you know, potato, I can't have potato. Well, you could have yams, you could have sweet potato, you could try eating purple potatoes or yellow potatoes. Some people say, when I eat a white potato, I don't feel great. But when I eat a purple or yellow, I feel fine. So I love that you say that. It's like, you need to listen to your body and you need to eat it and then see how do I feel after I eat it. Yeah. So for example, we, we quickly realized that as well, our toddler, and he was about one, maybe 11 months at the time. And he was just starting to eat solids. And uh, we tried eggplant at some point. And whenever he had eggplant, he would start scratching his nose and he would start scratching, like almost immediately he would start itching up to the point that just two or three days into, you know, when you start giving your, your, your children solids, you, you have to introduce the same food over a couple of days. He would just instinctively not eat them. He would recognize that and not eat them because he didn't feel right. And the thing is, as we grow older, we start becoming numb to all these signals that our body is sending us and we start ignoring them and we start kind of like forcing ourselves and we forget what feeling good feels like. So that's why it's so important to, to recognize and to listen to our bodies and to really evaluate and say, and, and figure out if it makes sense. And, and once you realize, and this is the most important and empowering part of this whole equation, once you realize what is affecting you, then you can consciously decide if you want to pay the price. So for instance, for me right now, if I eat bread or if I eat uh, gluten in general, I don't feel very good for about 36 hours. But sometimes I really want to have pizza. Now I know what, what the cost of having pizza is. It's like, am I willing to pay the price of 36 hours of not feeling so great? And 90% of the time, I'm not willing to, and it's not worthwhile. But 10% of the time it is. It's like, listen, I really want to have it. And I know what I'm getting myself into, but at least I'm making that decision consciously. And I'm not advocating here for people to, oh, it's, it's fine to have a cheat day. What I'm advocating for is it's fine to know your body and to make that decision for yourself. If you mm-hmm. feel like it's worth it, go for it. If you don't, then don't. But at least you are making that decision consciously. Yeah, absolutely. And like, you know, yellow yellow and purple potatoes are actually, they are nightshades, but sweet potatoes and yams are not yet nightshades. So, but but what's weird is I've literally had people say, even though these are nightshades, I can, you know, I feel fine eating this, but I, like you, you kind of said that there, there's a whole list, like one person might say, I can't have tomatoes, but I can have eggplant, you know, okay. which is, it, it is just so wild how you just, everyone is so different. Yeah, we need to we need to recognize that there's differences in that, and we need to make it okay for people to feel that way. Uh, I think that as health professionals in general, the, mo- the the ones that are the guiltiest of this are are us physicians like MDs, DOs, uh, westernly trained, typical medical doctors, because we're used to saying you know it's it's black or white, either either people get affected by it or not. Uh, and in reality, there's a lot of grace in that scale, and we need to to learn how to how to recognize that people might not feel good with one thing, and and they're not necessarily lying or making stuff up. It's just the way they feel, and then then once we know that, then we can work with it. One of the things I've realized is that there's so many chemicals in laundry detergent and the soaps out there. So I either make it myself, it's actually pretty easy, or I use my green fills. If you go to chantelrayway.com slash soap, I'll give you my free recipe for laundry soap. Or if you just feel like buying one that's really clean and not filled with tons of chemicals, you can get it there. chantelrayway.com slash soap. Hey guys, I'm on my way home from being on national TV talking about intermittent fasting and I'm answering the question, 
does intermittent fasting help you lose weight? Maybe you guys have tried intermittent fasting and lost some weight, but now you might just be stuck in a rut where you're not losing as much as you want. Well, I've interviewed over a thousand thin eaters and I've learned that intermittent fasting is just one of the tools they use, but there's so many more. There's nine other principles that they use to stay thin. To get out of your rut, click here to watch this free video. So explain to people what is ketosis and how do you, what is some easy ways that you know that you are in ketosis? Yeah, so, so ketosis, uh, the way that I see it is when our cells, they require a certain type of fuel right? And, in, and and they use this fuel to create energy and, and that energy inside our cells is ATP and, and that is produced inside the cells. And we can either use glucose or we can use ketones. Now, the easiest and most accessible form of this fuel is glucose. We, we produce glucose easily. We consume glucose easily. Uh, and our cells, a lot of the time, they get used to burning this type of fuel uh, for energy. Now, if we start decreasing the amount of carbs that we consume and those carbs are converted into glucose almost as soon as they enter our bloodstream and our cells use them, if we start decreasing the amount of carbs that we consume and we start increasing the amount of fats that we consume, what's going to happen is that our cells will be forced to start converting our fat into ketones. Now, these ketones are, are much more efficient are a lot cleaner to to burn and, and and I say that in a way that people can kind of like understand that they're 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 better source of fuel but a lot of the times they're not they're not easy to get to and that's why our body normally prefers because it's easier to get to our glucose that's why we used to hear that if you wanted to lose weight which I'm not entirely uh, in favor of but that's that's the reason behind the theory that if we wanted to lose weight we needed to be on the treadmill for 30 to 40 minutes right at medium to low intensity so that we would burn completely our glucose stores, and we would start actually burning our fat because it takes a while to burn that fat and convert it into ketones. Into ketones. But if we, on the other hand, instead of consuming glucose, we don't consume the glucose, we're forcing ourselves to essentially go into burning our fat for fuel and, and produce uh, ketone bodies that then our body can use to fuel, our cells can use to fuel themselves. So what do you think when somebody, let's say <clears throat> that they're fasting to, you know, obviously, you know, they can choose when, when your body doesn't have enough glucose for energy, it's burning, it stores fat. Well, yeah. it has two choices. One, you can either not eat to get there, right? Mm -hmm. Or you can just be eating fat and not have enough glucose. So either way, whether you're fasting or whether you're doing a keep, you know, a, a high keto diet, then, you know, either way you're going to get the same result. But what happens when lately I've been getting a lot of questions coming in where people are, are saying, you know, sometimes I might, you know, do intermittent fasting and I'm feeling great. And other days I'm doing intermittent fasting and, you know, I'm not feeling good. You know, my body obviously it's, it's already had a time, right? Like there's, you ha need to have time to get your body to transition from sugar burning to fat burning mode. We yeah. know that, but let's say someone's been doing this for quite a while and they're still like, why is it that some days, you know, I do so well and other days, you know, I, I feel terrible doing it. Well, your body has different requirements depending on 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 your life on on every day, uh, and it can be it can vary as widely as to what's happening around you. We tend to think that our body body only requires energy to do physical activity. So we think that, okay, well, it's because I've been working out, so that makes sense. But what about if you've been very stressed? What about if you've had to, you know, you've had a lot of different things in your mind, you've had to solve a lot of different issues, or, or the weather isn't really great, or you haven't been out in sunlight and you've been indoors for too long. What if you're fighting a virus and you're not even aware of it? So like right now, I'm still fighting a virus. We have a toddler, like I said earlier, which means that 
that since he's going to uh, to preschool, we have to be fighting viruses all the time. And sometimes it gets us. So you don't realize maybe you're feeling okay one day, but your body internally maybe has been fighting off an infection, a viral infection for two or three days, and you don't fully realize it. So my recommendation of that is listen to your body. We're no longer, when we, when we think about intermittent fasting and, and reduced windows of eating, we, we associate that to what it was like thousands of years ago when there was no refrigeration and, and our ancestors had to literally go out there and hunt. And maybe they would hunt and they would have something for one day and they wouldn't be able to eat for two or three. They weren't having three meals a day, right? But nowadays, that's, that's not the case. What I say is like, that doesn't necessarily mean that you should be eating all day. But if you wake up one day, and you're really hungry, then you need to nourish your body. You need to eat. You need to, you know, you need to listen to your body and not just try to soldier through it. Um, it happens to me all the time. I, I tend to skip breakfast and I'll just go back home and I'll have lunch at about 1, 1 1.30 PM. But sometimes I wake up and I'm hungry in the morning and I'll have breakfast. It's for me, it's not such a, such a huge deal. And I know that a lot of people tend to think like, no, 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 intermittent fasting and you don't eat anything until 2 PM. It's like, I think again, that's that's going too much into the black and white. I think you need to listen to your body and don't exaggerate that. It's not like you wake up and just because you saw somebody eating, you suddenly want to have breakfast. Like you know, make an effort. But if you're if you're genuinely hungry, then eat breakfast. There's, there's I don't see a problem with it. Yeah. So um, let's talk a little bit about stem cells. And so you have spent years learning about stem cells. First, for people who don't even know what that term is, give us a little introduction. And then what kind of work have you done in this space? Yeah, so stem cells are, are, are you know, in the simplest of terms. They're kind of like our, our, our ancestor cells. The, as our cells start maturing and start, it's a process called differentiating. And it just basically means that they're becoming specialized. So we have stem cells are, you can think of them as generic and as they start maturing, they can start specializing. They will branch out, and that's why they're called stem cells, because they, they are in the stem. And then they will start branching out and become specialized cells, kind of like you have this generic cell that eventually can either lead to a muscle cell or to a bone cell or to a uh, nerve cell or to anything like that. They, they, they keep specializing and branching out. Now, when we talk, we all have stem cells. That's how we repair our body. We all have stem cells circulating right now. They recognize something's damaged and they will become that, that, that tissue that will differentiate into that tissue. When we talk about stem cell therapy, that's the ability of, of, of doctors to actually go in and grab those stem cells and then utilize them in a concentrated manner to achieve a result. So whether it is healing, whether it is repairing, whether it is regenerating, uh, all those are, are, are forms of uh, stem cell therapy. Um, one of the most common sources of stem cell therapy, there, there are two big sources of stem cells for stem cell therapy, and one of them is autologous, which means that the cells come from you. The, one of the most common sources there are, is your bone marrow. So you can do a bone marrow aspirate, you separate and you have the stem cells to, to treat yourself. The other that was popular a while ago was um, adipose tissue. So they would do a micro liposuction. Uh, they would separate the stem cells from, from the fat and you could use that. But there's several other sources of, of stem cells. You can get them from, from the pulp of the teeth and, and in several other areas. And then we also have the donated cells. And donated cells are usually from cord blood and for from cord tissue. And that's why you see a lot of banks and a lot of different uh, alternatives there. So what are you using it for? Like what, so if someone came to you, what, what are you using stem cells for in your practice? Well, I'm currently not practicing. Uh, I'm, I'm doing mostly patient education. I have another business where we work with doctors in, in training. But in my practice, when I was practicing in, in, in Cancun, we used to treat a lot of, of children with autism. So autism and cerebral palsy, we developed a, a specific uh, therapeutic uh, protocol for, for those kind of conditions. And it's all encompassing. I think one of the most common mistakes or one of the most common misconceptions that people have about stem cell therapy is that it is it is miraculous. And, and just by applying stem cells, then you're good to go. When in reality, it's more, it has to be more of, of a holistic approach. It has to be part of a more thorough therapeutic application. So for instance, when we were treating children with autism, 
we also had to make sure that those children were being seen by a doctor specialized in biomedical approaches and that their their heavy metals were looked at and their toxins were evaluated and that they were eating a clean diet and all those things. Because if not, then the stem cells aren't really going to work. Something that I always used to say, stem cell therapy is something you do in addition to a proper therapeutic protocol, not instead of. So it's not the easy solution. It's something that you do to complement what you're currently doing. And that applies across the board, whether you're using it for multiple sclerosis, which, which was a very common application for lupus, for rheumatoid arthritis, for orthopedic conditions, osteoarthritis, anything along those lines, you have to be doing everything else that surrounds the treatment of that one particular condition. Mm. Yeah, so that, that's what I was going to say is that I would say that the stem cell therapies that I've heard of is the multiple sclerosis. I've heard of um, like some, you know, just different things. I'm trying to think of what other things that I've heard, but Osteoarthritis what would you say if you the top lupus. three? The top three. I'm sorry? Like the, what are the top three things that you've heard people, like you've said, I've seen the best bang for the result for people who have done stem cell. So in our experience, from what we treated, uh, we saw great results with autism. Uh, obviously, that's why we focused so much of our time and effort in, in autism. And we developed a specific protocol. And we actually built a whole clinic just for autistic patients. Uh, but then we also saw great results with, uh, with COPD. So, so patients who had COPD, whether, whether it was acquired uh, because of, of lifestyle uh, issues, that they were smokers or they had amyloidosis or, or something along those lines, we saw some things there that you wouldn't believe. Like this one lady came to see us and she was from Bermuda and she was on a wait list for a lung transplant. Now, the survival rate for a lung transplant for five years is about 10%. So only about 10% of people who get a lung transplant uh, make it past five years. And she was on the wait list for that. And her son decided to bring her over to Cancun and documented on spirometry before and after treatment, 36 hours of, of an IV infusion, she had a 40% improvement in her respiratory function rate. It was, it was amazing. And she's still, I mean, she's still going strong and this must have been about six or seven years ago. And her doctors back in New York that, that had her on a wait list for lung transplant, instead of getting ecstatic about her, you know what they said? Oh, we must have misdiagnosed you originally. There's no way you could have gotten this much better with just a stem cell treatment. Mm. So yeah, talk about what does that look like? Cause I'm, I've never actually seen that happen. So is that like, where are they getting the stem cells from number one and number two, are they just putting it in an IV? So like, let's say I said, okay, I'm here. I want some stem cell therapy. Like, like for example, my, one of my issues that I still have not been able to combat, I've really healed a lot of pieces of my, my body, but the one piece that I have not been able to is psoriasis. I have psoriasis on my scalp and psoriasis on my forehead. Um, so, so, so psoriasis is one of the big ones that, that, that can get a benefit and, um, there are different protocols and, and here's the other thing that people need to understand. Stem cell therapy is just a tool in a doctor's toolbox. It should not be a, a, a specialty on its own, which means that when I was a faculty member for the American Academy of, of, of Anti-Aging Medicine under, under Stem Cell Fellowship, we trained doctors all across the board. So dermatologists, anti-aging doctors, uh, uh, rheumatologists, doctors who were just doing autoimmune disorders and so on. And the most important thing that I learned is that not just because you're a doctor and you have access to stem cells, does it mean that you can treat everything that is treatable with stem cells? That would be like saying, just because I, I'm a surgeon and I can get myself a, a scalpel, then I can operate any kind of thing that I want. Nobody, nobody would believe that, right? So why are we thinking a lot of the times that just any doctor can treat anything uh, with stem cells? So that's the number one thing. There's different protocols to answer your question. Some of them, or most of them, are IV. Now, there's a problem with IV with certain conditions. When you put stem cells or essentially anything else into a vein, the first stop is always going to be in the lungs because you go into the veins, then you go right into the heart, the right side of the heart that's going to pump it out 
into the lungs. So the lungs are going to keep about 70% of those stem cells that you infuse. They're going to stay there. And that's why respiratory issues, respiratory illnesses have such an improvement with stem cells because most of them stay there. And the remaining 30% are going to circulate throughout the entire body. And, and, and you're going to get a, a very, very a smaller result, depending on what you want to treat. When we were treating children with autism or any other a neurologic or neurodegenerative disorder, we were also doing lumbar punctures with stem cells. Now, the advantage of doing a lumbar puncture is you're going directly into the central nervous system. Inside the central nervous system, you have the brain, the brainstem, and uh, the spinal cord, and all of those structures are bathed in cervospinal fluid. So if you deposit stem cells into that cervospinal fluid, it will bathe the brain and all these different structures, and it'll stay there. So that's, that's how you approach a neurological condition, uh, an orthopedic condition. What you want to do is you want to inject directly into the joint, directly into the, the affected um, tendon or ligament or muscle or whatever you want to treat. And you do that with ultrasound. So every kind of stem cell treatment is different. For some of them, you can totally show up and, and, and get an IV stem cells, especially now in the US that we're seeing a lot of these off the shelf stem cells. Now I like to call them kind of like uh, starter stem cell treatments uh, because they have a smaller effect, but they're off the shelf. You can literally show up and get a stem cell treatment if you're the right candidate. Uh, for something more thorough, like what we were offering, you have to go outside of the US and, and, and it's, it's a longer treatment. It's usually three to five day protocol. So, Help me understand. So if you, if someone, where are they getting the stem cells to put into me? Are they, are they taking, are they taking healthy people? They do tests and they go, okay, you're healthy. We're taking these stem cells from you and putting it in. Like, where are they coming with these stem cells? Uh, the ones that you currently see in the U S from different distributors, uh, in theory, in theory, they are healthy people that are donating these um, these umbilical cords, um, the the umbilical blood, the umbilical cord blood, and um, that that healthy birds from C sections, and supposedly they have all these different tests, and that they're in the U.S. In reality, a lot of them are being born in Puerto Rico, and then the, the blood is shipped, and then they're processed. So. It's it's difficult to tell. Can you can you know exactly who you're getting it from? No, not really. And then each each batch will only yield about eight to twelve different eight to twelve vials. So it's not it's not easily trackable either. Um, is that bad? Not necessarily. So if you're healthy, then you're you know you shouldn't have a problem. The problem comes when you have an autoimmune disorder and you react to very small things. Then you might have, that's, that's what we're starting to see some of these people who have these, these allergic reactions, these uh, flare-ups uh, or these different symptoms. What we were currently utilizing, we had both from donated cord blood and autologous. So depending on your condition, sometimes it's better to just get your bone marrow and treat you with that with your own cells. Sometimes it's better to use umbilical cord blood. Now the difference and the advantage of using it outside of the US, and that's one of the big problems right now, is that in the US, you cannot grab those cells and culture them. One of the great advantages of stem cells is that you can put those cells in a Petri dish, in an incubator with the right growth medium and all these things, and they will grow and they will multiply, and then you just get the stem cells. You don't get everything else. In the US, you just you can just separate them and, and you have to inject them as, as a cocktail. Otherwise, the, the FDA considers it as manipulated. And if it is manipulated, then they need to undergo a whole series of different tests and processes and stage one and two and three uh, testing before they're, they're allowed to go out on the market. And that's a big part of the problem that we're seeing. Outside of the US, you can totally culture and expand these cells, and then you get a much more potent uh, treatment when it's cultured and expanded. So you can get both. Currently in the US, you're probably just getting uh, umbilical cord blood from uh, from in theory, healthy donors. Yeah. So these are like embryos that are like 
Oh no 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 they're they're not they're not embryos no 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 okay. these are these are full term births so oh, okay. uh, so when when there's a there's a C section uh, the, the the baby is born and uh, they cut the cord and then they take all the blood inside of the cord and uh, and and even some of it that that was still circulating the placenta and they collect that blood and there's a lot of stem cells there. So I guess if someone's giving birth, do they like give approval to, to like, would that be like, if, like, if I was going to go give birth tomorrow, do I give my approval That's, or they just take? No, no, no. You have to, you have to consent to donate them. Now, what they're currently saying, we don't really know. Uh, supposedly these people are being told that if, if they want to donate their placenta and umbilical cord, which I mean, if they don't donate it, they, they, they're just thrown out in the bin, away. Right. They're, they're thrown away. Um, so most people will agree to donate them. What most people don't really know is that these companies are buying the blood and then profiting from that. So there's a big debate as to whether these people should be compensated for for the, the the business that these these distributors and manufacturers are currently doing with it, uh, I don't I don't like to get involved in that. I don't, but I I, I do think there's there's an ethical debate there. Yeah, because I mean, well, my son, he is eight years old. So I gave birth eight years ago to him, but I don't remember them ever saying, hey, do you mind, do you mind take, us taking your umbilical cord and using it or signing anything? I don't remember it. Maybe they did. I'm not sure. They don't, they don't do it. They don't do it everywhere. Obviously not every hospital is part of it. Uh, mm -hmm. These are, these are from, you know, most of these manufacturers and distributors, they buy the blood from, from big public banks. These are big public court banks. So, but you would have been told, you would have had to, to disclose that, um, you know, and you would have had to sign something. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, this has been amazing. Tell listeners where they can find you and where they can follow you. Yeah, for sure. So uh, my website is drernestomd.com and I'm on social media with pretty much that same handle. So uh, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Dr. The R Ernesto MD. Uh, that's, that's the handle everywhere. And uh, feel free to just reach out. And if you have questions, if there's something I can help you with, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to weigh in. Awesome. And if you have a question that you want answered, go to questions at ChantalRayway.com. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.